There's a classic problem in human behavior. It has the title of time discounting, but it's, a, it's just a really common problem and, and this idea, this term time discounting doesn't do justice to how intuitive it is. And it really has to do with how you evaluate the future and how you make choices about things that, that, that um, you can receive now or at some later point in the future. So this is, it's called time discounting because if I offer you something you like, but I say you have to wait a week for it, then it's not worth as much to you as, as receiving it right now. And, and the degree to which you don't like it as much, this prospect of a future outcome, it, the, the, the degree by which the value is reduced as a function of delay is called time discounting. That process of devaluation is called time discounting. Time discounting is, is really a, kind of a fascinating ages old problem trying to understand how we do it. Because there, there are some fundamental problems that we have. So the, the, the classic problem is you know, the fact that your, your preferences for things distributed across time changes as a function of the progression of time. So you can have very wholeheartedly believe that you wish to behave in a far-sighted manner, to be very healthy, to save your money, and do everything that your mother told you you should do. But then as soon as the, pro the ability, temptations arise to violate those preferences, we have a tendency, we have this sort of internal conflict that leads us to all too often succumb to the temptation and violate our you know, better intentions. So this is, this is really the fundamental question in time discounting is, how is it that we evaluate things across time that leads to these time-dependent preference reversals that make us want to do one thing but then only to violate our best wishes when the, when the temptations arise. One, one way of, of um, thinking about this, this question that's been around um, in psychology, um, philosophy, economics for a long time is by positing that we actually have many different motivations, that our behavior is driven by many independent considerations and we have different ways of evaluating the world and that because we have these different styles of evaluating the world, that sometimes they, lead, they, can, make, they can conflict. And, and this is sort of the classic um, take on how time discounting works, which is that we have an ability to formulate long-term plans and think about things in very abstract fashion and generate our best wishes and best desires. But we also have this ability to evaluate the world, see something as a very attractive, desirable good, generate emotions and high motivation to achieve it, but it's, it seems fundamentally different. One is very deliberative in nature, where you think and plan and reason. The other is driven by the here and now, and the presence of something that seems very appetitive and, and, and satisfying. And so this has been a, a long, an old idea. It's, it's called the a dual selves model of, um, of time discounting or, and, or preferences. And uh, there's been a, a, you know, a lot of interest for really hundreds of years in this, in this notion. Um, and it's just, it's hard, it's been hard to test um, because it, it makes a lot of sense, but you, you start trying to, it's hard to pull apart these separate selves and study them independently. Th this is where neuroscience has really, um, really contributed. Because if there really are these sort of multiple selves, then maybe the, their, their physical instantiation in the brain should also be different. Um, and we know that the brain kind of functions this way. For example, we know that the visual system from our eye back, the projections back from our eye back to the brain have many independent pathways that communicate qualitatively different information about the visual world and that get put together in our visual cortex to solve different kinds of problems like identifying what we're looking at, figuring out how it's moving and how we should interact with it. All these different types of ways we interact with our visual world are processed along different parallel streams and this is, leads to this sort of fundamental notion about the way the brain functions, which is that information is processed along these parallel pathways where you're extracting different types of information about the world to behave um, based on different types of goals that, that may be relevant to you. So this notion about the brain, that the brain works in this parallel distributed fashion, um, corresponds nicely to um, this dual selves idea, where maybe there are different, different pathways within this, different ways of evaluating the world. One that's more 
affective or emotional in nature, and another is more deliberative in nature. And they give rise to these different ways of evaluating the future that lead to conflict these, and these preference reversals. So um, neuroscience has been trying to test this, and, and um, it turns out that there are systems in the brain, networks of, of brain areas that interact to control behavior that roughly correspond to this idea of this sort of more affective and more deliberative kind of system. So for the affective system, um, this really seems to correspond to these, this basic old evolutionary system that's driven, that's driven by this, that releases this neurotransmitter dopamine. So the dopamine system we, we know is re, um, re associated with emotions. So if you activate the dopamine system, then you have there's positive arousal and positive emotions that correspond to that. It has basic motivational properties. So if you, this activated system, you there's it's strongly associated with a sense of motivation for seeking whatever is available in your environment, and it sort of functions is in this relatively automatic fashion where dopamine is released to signal the value of things in your world through direct association. So when you see something in the world, it triggers the dopamine system in this automatic fashion to release the amount of dopamine that's, that corresponds to how valuable that, that, that thing is. And so you, there's sort of this automatic, very highly motivational, emotional system that's triggered by just its cues in the world to, to drive your behavior to seek those, cues, those outcomes. Okay, so that's the dopamine system, so that kind of corresponds to the sort of more automatic, affective kind of system. And then we also know that there's another system in the brain that's dependent on something completely different, which is the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex we know a lot about largely because of, of lesions. So if you have a stroke that causes damage to your prefrontal cortex, then you sort of selectively lose, lose the ability to formulate abstract goals and guide your behavior um, on the basis of those goals. One of the consequences of, of damage to this region is called environmental dependency syndrome. So um, it's, it's this really sort of fascinating set of uh, problems. Um, what, what, what characterizes it is that your behavior becomes really dependent on exactly what's directly in front of you. Um, and you have, and, and these patients have an inability to, to guide their behavior sort of more flexibly based on sort of um, abstract goals. One of my favorite um, discussions of this was by this um, French physician named Lermite who um, wrote this beautiful paper in the 80s where he took pre patients with pre damage to the prefrontal cortex to his house and then he just wrote about what they did in his house. And one, one, of the, one patient, for example, he was showing him around his house, you know, showing, just giving him a tour, showing him all the rooms. And when he got to the bedroom, he saw the bed and the automatic response when he saw the bed was to take off his clothes and climb into the bed. And this is not the appropriate response at your doctor's house, but he was, this is the environmental dependency syndrome. He wasn't able to maintain this abstract goal, which is, oh, I need to be you know, gracious and a nice guest. I need to not do my automatic response of climbing into the bed. So this sort of, this ability to sort of abstractly pl plan, structure your behavior in accord with abstract goals, this really corresponds to this more deliberative kind of system. So, so, so you have the, this beautiful correspondence between old theories in, in psychology and philosophy and then new ideas about different brain systems and how they interact. And what's really happened over the past 15 years now is sort of putting these two things together, using functional brain imaging in people to see whether these two systems are actually in competition when people are making choices about, about rewards over the future whether activity in one system or the other determines the choice, whether you can bias activity in one way or the other by manipulating these systems, and um, really trying to put together in sort of a dynamical, you know, dynamical systems model about how choice arrives out of the interaction of qualitatively different systems. And, and the, the work has really been incredibly successful. So we have this ability to take a, what's called a transcranial magnetic stimulator. You can put it over the prefrontal cortex and kind of shut it down for a little while, you zap, zap somebody for about 10 minutes and then the prefrontal cortex doesn't work so well for the next 10 minutes. And if you do that, then you shut down this deliberative system and people become much more impulsive and they have the, a much harder time waiting to receive future rewards. You can also give drugs that directly act, um, and facilitate the, the, um, the dopamine system. So there are a number of drugs out there, they're used clinically all the time, but if you give them to normal patients, then it turns out that you activate 
this more affective system and people become more impulsive. And then you can study brain activity to sort of as people are normally behaving. And you can do a pretty good job of predicting when they're going to be impatient, and when they're going to be not, and when they're going to be patient, and when they're going to stick with their long-term goals versus succumb and eat the chocolate cake even though they really should eat the salad. And um, you could you start predicting this kind of behavior. So this has been one big advance in neuroscience is using brain imaging to attack fundamental old age-old questions about how it is that our behavior can give these sort of strange properties where we have the inability to sort of maintain preferences through time and we kick ourselves for behaving in ways that we know we're going to regret. And we can put this together now in sort of a dynamical way to understand really the, the dynamics of brain activity that give rise to these patterns of behavior.